Okay, so we are on our fourth out of five sessions. Man, I, I don't know where this year went, but it sure is flying quickly. <clears throat> so we will have our last one somewhere around, uh, I think it's the end of April, and that will take us to the end of June um, for planning, and then we should be good to go from there. Um, so what I'd like to go through today is uh, we're going to find as we start looking at our sort of our year at a glance for those who've been following that we're at a point now where we're more into reviewing not reviewing in the sense of just starting we finished everything but reviewing outcomes to um, meet the learner, the learner outcome that's stated in the curriculum document because up until now we've been bridging We've been trying to make sure that we've mastered to the end of January fives and hundred, like the twenties that we need. Like we really wanted to get some of those foundational pieces because of the jumps that had to be made. And so now you're just really working on revisiting, revisiting, revisiting to getting to a hundred or whatever number it is that you're working on at this point. So a lot of the things that we talked about in the last session would be to and give you some ideas of things that you might be able to do to revisit. Um, just to make it fresher for the students, another uh, maybe another approach for them so that they don't even know that they're actually reviewing the same, uh, just different target is all we're doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about fractions again, because that conversation is comes up now in our year at a glance again, and it's not a fraction in terms of a written number of one over something. That's not what they're asked to do in grade one. So we'll just talk about that. I want to spend a little bit of time on symmetry because that is also a piece that comes into play at this point in time and uh, cycles. So let's get started. We'll start with our acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history may have forgotten. Okay, so I am just going to run through like we always have. I'm going to look at February, March, April, because kind of what we're trying to stretch through here, just to make sure that we're kind of on the same page. We have our 100 days celebration. Um, and and those pieces kind of the the yellows are now starting to disappear in our year at a glance because we're kind of getting to those points already where we've we've met the bridging pieces and now we can really focus on what the stated learner outcome was and just that's our target to the end of June because we don't have to report on that until the end of June. So when we talk about um, the hundreds, a lot of you were targeting to try to get to 100, counting, practicing, they may not be fluent in it, but so that you could celebrate the 100 day with that. Um, we're also still looking at, and you're going to see the same numbers kind of show up over and over and over again. They're not going to change from month to month because we still have to revisit to mastery, but we will start to see things like um, talking about multiple ways of getting numbers, starting numbers more sincerely between two values less starting at one all the time so we are really trying to slide them towards that hundred number and i know it's a bit of a leap but a lot of our kids are getting there the kiddos are are making some pretty good strides so uh, we'll celebrate that in our patterns you're also talking about cycles and i know many of you started patterns at the beginning of the year and leveraged it with your seasons and that's a perfect time to do it um, but it also comes back as a review now, and I'm going to give you some First Nations pieces in there that might help with the cycling. So that gives you another venue to bring up the conversation again. Uh, time, again, talking about cycles. And then uh, we talk about that section on geometry where we're talking about symmetry. And it's a really timely place for us because it's also a good time that we can link the symmetry to fractions because the word that you have to teach them in grade one is halves they are supposed to see the world in light of halves where do i see halves not one over two not numerator denominator that language doesn't even come into play in grade one at all it's just halves where do i see halves in the world and what does that look like and so i could build that with pattern blocks i could build that with um, pictures, I can build that with symmetry. Those are the other places where I can see there's two halves. So we'll make those linkages. Um, I'm not going to go right here right now, but the math kit, remember, on the Moving Forward website 
had a whole bunch of images in it. You don't have to have built the kit to, to download the images for symmetry that you could use as examples. We'll, we'll come back to this. So again, you see that in March and April, we're seeing the same outcome numbers are showing up because all you're doing is you are now working on mastery to explain all those quantities to 100. So in all the different areas that we had before, remember that the bullets are simply your understanding. So we still need to go back and revisit our knowledge and skills and procedures to make sure that we are in, embracing all of those different components. Uh, when we talk about the patterns, we also want them to see that not all patterns repeat in the same way or all the time the same way, and that some do, some go on forever. So let's talk a little bit about this section on ge uh, symmetry in geometry, because that's one that you may not have started and it should be sliding into our curriculum. Now's a good time to do it. Spring's coming. We can use lots of things in spring for symmetry, um, especially as leaves come out and we see flowers start to eventually bloom. We start to see moths or butterflies or whatever come back. So I have, um, and we won't watch these right now, but I just want to point out to you to, to introduce the notion of symmetry. Um, a number of teachers like to just show a video first, not even talk about the word yet, and just say, here's, here's one of the topics we're going to talk about today. If you're going to do it that way, the very first one that has the blue, blue butterfly on it would be your starting video. So if you like to show kids just to pique their interest to see what's going on, this one would be the starting one. It's much lower level. It's very introductory in terms of symmetry. If you want to follow up after a couple of days and you want to go just a little bit deeper, but still at your grade level, then I would use the second one that has the heart in it. Just as a, we've been doing a little bit of activity. Now we're going to follow it up. Let's review, see what we learned from before. They're not identical in what they talk about. And the second one does offer them a little bit more but it wouldn't be the starting one. What I want to do though is I will go into the fraction one and you have this in your folders as well. You'll be able to access it from there. So I just want to review the, the part about fractions <clears throat> with this curriculum because it does not use the symbolic language at all in grade one. The first time they see that symbolic language is actually at, towards the end of grade two. So they actually do the word part of fractions first in grade two in terms of quarters and they revisit halves. And it's not until they come down to the very end that we actually show that the symbolic doesn't mean I can't talk about one half, but I just don't go into the lingo and the typical writing that we launch into right away for fractions. So it's just words, words and understanding. Fractions have been proven to be excellent indicators for students' academic success. Not academic success in fractions alone, any academic success. When they nail fractions early on, they seem to do better academically all the way through their grades. When they don't understand fractions from the beginning, it's not a concept that they pick up as they get older. They don't go to Div 2 or Div 3 and then have aha moments. Fractions is one of those ones that is very complex. And if they don't seem to get it, the research has shown they don't tend to get it very well at all ever. And so it's not something that we want to pick up. So there's no rush to get into the symbolic. It's more can we just get to the understanding piece and then go from there. We need those fractions to understand measurement better, especially now that we're also doing imperial measure with them and the foundation of imperial measure was fractions, right? That's where, that was second to, to none for most people. Probability and algebra are also based on fractional understanding. And there isn't a thing that you don't do on a given day that doesn't really affect proportional reasoning, which is a fraction. You know, if you say that I've got this many candies, I've got this many kids and I wanna divvy them out, I've got approximately this much to this, this to this, you're using proportional reasoning. We don't necessarily talk about it in everyday language that way, but, but that's what we do. We do that automatically. When you add cream to your coffee, you're adding a certain amount of cream to whatever the size of mug that you, you have in your hand. That's proportional reasoning. So, so we use it so often in our day-to-day -day routines, and students need to know that, that they're going to see it a lot. Some of the challenges that occur from 
from fractions. Just giving this to you now so that we have a good understanding right from the ground up. Same thing with the uh, kindergartens, we talked about the same thing. Students struggle with the notion of that there's a relationship when we talk about fractions and show them numbers right away. So when I write one over two, most students, we think it's really obvious that when I say I'm gonna break a cookie in half and give you half and I'm gonna keep half, that it's intuitive to them that that means that they got one out of two pieces. Whereas the research tells us that that's actually not true. Most students, more than 50% see that as the number one that you taught me to count on a number line and the number two that follows it on a number line. Not that they are related differently other than just counting by ones. So that makes it really hard for kids to, to understand that there's relationships as parts of um, if they don't get the whole idea that we even have this notion that fractions a number and that's one of the other pieces is students did not identify fractions as a number when researchers went in and said what is a fraction they said well it's like it's a fraction they said well where where do you think it fits in all the math that you learned they're called fractions because we typically introduce it as a fraction we make it sound like it's its own little unit and world that we live in and then the kids don't actually realize that fractions are something that you count by on a number line. So in your new curriculum, there is huge emphasis placed on learning how to count on a number line with the unit fraction. So there's a much heavier emphasis going back to the unit fraction and what role it plays. If you teach me in grade one to count to 100 by ones, then where am I learning how to count by fractions by one unit? And that comes back into play. The other challenges with fractions is the why. And this is a comment from teachers. The teachers that were interviewed in the most recent study <clears throat> said, my kids do phenomenal in fractions. I can explain it to them, I can show it to them, we do it, we all get 100%. But I don't know why it works the way it does. I'm not sure that I even got told, told that as a, as a student myself. So for example, why do you invert and multiply when you divide fractions? Why do you add with a common denominator? Why? Why do we do that? We do it, but why do we do it? So those are some of the challenges that came up. But one of the other pieces was that North American teachers love circles. We have an overemphasis on the use of circles when we try to talk about fractions, which is true. Like, I've done books. And when you look at your books, you'll find that most of them have, oh, sorry, most of them will have in there, um, they have circles, they have pizzas, they have cookies. And we use that as a common starting point, which we understand as kindergarten and grade one teachers, they understand what a cookie is, they get that. But in theory, the circle is the most difficult thing for a student to actually divide up for a fraction. The better thing would be a square or a hexagon or something that I can even fold over several different ways Whereas a circle, when I say to you, can you divide it as adults right now, draw a perfect circle and divide it into a perfect third, most of you would say, yeah, give me a protractor and I'll give you a perfect 120 degree angle. But without it, not likely to happen, or fifths or sevenths or ninths. So again, using a different symbol is something that they're suggesting we start up very, very early on. So when we talk about fractions, we always talk about the word relationship in the younger grades right now. So kindergarten, grade one, how are these two related? How is this part of my cookie that I gave you as an example related to this cookie? Well, putting it together gave me the whole cookie. Okay, they can relate to that. How does this quarter of my square fit with this? If you took pattern blocks and took four orange squares and put them together, how do they relate? Well, they make a bigger square. Right? So there, those are the kinds of conversations about relationships, less about the numbers, just park the number part. So kind of resist the urge of saying a fraction is, and then defining it or showing them what it would be written as. We just wanna kind of leave those out for now. This is really where we wanna be. In grade one, we want them to see pictures. We want them to see, what do you see here? Well, I see a sandwich that got cut in half. What does that mean? Well, it means there's two pieces. What do you know about those two pieces, right? It's that conversation piece, the word piece, not the number piece. 
I see a watermelon got cut in half. Or if I've got some children who play music, they would know that's a half note, right? So it's just giving them those opportunities. This one's always been a great one for kids too. What is that? It's a glass that's half full. And then you could say, do you think it's half empty? Right, have that conversation so that they see it from two different perspectives. Just find pictures, let them walk around the hallways. Where could you find pieces that would have two equal pieces? That also lends to the symmetry conversation that you have. When they get into grade twos, they talk about quarters, the word quarters, not one over four. That doesn't come until the very end. So I could take a medicine wheel and divide it in and talk about the four different quarters that are there and that each one of them has a meaning of seasons. Each one has a meaning for emotion. Each one has a meaning for an animal. It's a cycle, right? It, it repeats itself. A quarter, we actually have quarters in our money. And what does that mean? And what takes four to make a loony? So it's just that conversation piece that we want them to have, that visual representation. Okay, let's move on. All right, let's move on here. So in the kits, when we talked about those at the very beginning of the year, when we kind of introduced those, and again, you don't have to have a kit to, to have the conversation, but if you have any of those um, templates in your schools where you can make letters for the bulletin boards and whatever, this is how I made these. I simply took just small pieces of foam that I bought at Dollarama and I just used those and just cut them out. Well, these are great because I can just fold them in half. They're foam, they're not paper, so they're not gonna leave a permanent crease on it. And it lets students check to see whether or not there's two equal pieces, that, that they don't overlap or that there's something missing on each one. It also will lend into that conversation about symmetry then. And then what kinds of shapes do they have that don't let them do that? How do I use a clock to make it so that I have two halves of the clock, right? So I can make it six o'clock so I see this side and this side. What are the similarities? I see the same shape. What do I see that's different? I see different numbers, right? Just having that conversation. Where else in the school can they walk? Where else in the room can they walk? And what would they see in your classroom that would be good demonstrations of halves? We also started the year with this picture and that was just dump the money. So dumping the money was also an opportunity for us to share between two people you get the same coin once i've got them sorted let's share them out so that you and i get the same amounts of of money so they would take them once they've got them grouped they would share them out and then some of them obviously if i had three nickels would have some leftovers this is still part of the fraction still part of saying you got the same piece that i did only we're not writing it down as one over two we have leftovers we can talk about what leftovers would be so that's kind of the whole umbrella of the fractional conversation that they want to go to in grade one. Okay, let me just get out of this one. Oops. The other piece that comes into, even with symmetry, if you think about finding the number six on a number line, what numbers before it, what numbers after it, the distance between those two is identical. So I can talk about symmetry in that regard, not that I see the same number, but the distance on each side is the same, right? So I can have students make that connection. Number lines, I know caught a lot of teachers off guard when they had to give the testing this year. They said, well, I don't do these number lines, like they're way over the top for our kids. And in actual fact, they're not, because we, we use the number line to teach them how to skip count we use the number line to still count numbers to 20 backwards forwards skip counting by fives to going to 100 20s to 100 they'd be using their money for that at the same time so we need to be more intentional about bringing number lines and having them on their desk daily as opposed to just an occasional so that they can just move back and forth with them there are differences between number lines and number paths and we need to be really clear with students the difference between them. So when they are first learning how to count and they're worrying, worrying right now, or they're learning how to go to 100 to master 100. When we learn to count, we learn on sometimes our fingers in kindergarten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This is actually a number path because we don't have a zero finger. 
So number paths are what we use when we are basically working on uh, teaching students how to count. When I move to measurement, it's a different conversation to have. So I'm just going to bring up some number paths here because subitizing is also in your curriculum. And so I've run off a couple of these and there's more. They go to 20s, to 100s, whatever you want. But here's just an example of a number path. Notice it starts at 1, goes to 10. I see the words 1 to 10. I see subitizing 1 to 10, which they have to be able to do in grade 1. You could take this sheet. You, there, it's in your folder. You can just print them off and laminate them if you want. We've even asked students to go find dominoes that would be other subitized versions of 10. What else could I make to get to 10? Not just five and five. Go find another domino. Show me a dice combination. So they just bank them below each of their number lines to find different combinations because subitizing is a part of grade one. They need to quickly be able to identify the basic numbers and then so I can add on. And then when I get into my teens, my 10 plus the number, what does my 10 look like? And then what am I familiar with to regroup to get to the next number? So these are called number paths. They're in different colors. You can see there's blues and greens. I mean, you can choose whatever you want. Um, but the nice part about this too is the alternating colors at the top also give you the odd even combinations, right? I see odd and even numbers that are alternating in different colors. I can see that I'm skip counting by twos and the red and so on. So you can go in, I will show you where to get those in, in a bit here. So those are the number paths. When you want to move to a number line, you are really looking at introducing zero because a number line says, I am going to measure something when I put zero in, not just count. So if I want to say, I am going to talk about distances. I'm going to talk about anything that goes onto a ruler. Then I have to have zero because the purpose of having zero is telling you from zero to whatever your first number is on your ruler, that's the distance of one unit. That's how much one unit is on your tool that you are using, whatever that tool may be. So they need to know the difference between a number line and a number path. So when they're just counting on their fingers, that's why we don't have the zero because I'm not measuring a distance with my thumb to my finger. That would be the purpose of having the zero there. And then later as they get older, they learn that there's numbers that go on the other side of zero. So again, I put these in here into your folders and they come in different colors, but also again, you can see the different colors for skip counting are also there. Um, and that they can see that 10 is in red and now I move forward. So there's my increments of 10. So I can start to see my tens and my teen numbers, how they develop in between. So again, you can, you don't have to use any of these if you don't want. If you've got rulers already on their desk, I wouldn't worry about it. Those come from Sparklebox. And we've shared that with you once before, but Sparklebox is free to you. You can download anything from there with no royalty issues. So any more, there's more number lines. They go to 100 if you prefer 100. Just go into the sparkle box one that's here. There's one I've downloaded for you that counts by five and then there's a number line. But there's other ones too, like I could look at counting by fives through this one. So again, if you live in a farming community, pick the cow ones. If you live in a mountain community, pick the one that has skiing on it or the animals or a bear or whatever. I mean, there's all different ones that they can have, but here I am working just on currently skip counting by fives. How does it look? I also have some for skip counting by tens and so on. So again, all the different variations have been downloaded into different sheets for you. You can do the same thing with, if you'd like to scatter things on the floor or give them a bag, this is our fish one that goes by counting by fives. And all we did here is we just, trim, we didn't trim them out instantly. We just kind of went around them very quickly. We threw them into a brown paper bag and the kids just go grab a bag when they're ready and they dump it on the floor and then they have to put them in the order that they need to be for counting to fives. So again, just an engagement review, make sure they know how to count to fives, not just rote memory. Can they do it on the floor? Can they show you the numbers and so on? Uh, there's another one for building to 10 where they need to build a flower. So this again is just in a bag, the different components of it. 
they've got the pot, they've got the leaves, they have to build the flower in order in order to make it a perfect count to 100. So again, just ways for them to go through and put things together. You also have, at the beginning of the year, we talked about subitizing cards. So those, we hope, are out there a lot with the kids. They should be available to them, even if they have five minutes to spare before recess, that they can just pull them, play war with each other, turn the card over. What number do you see? So I see this as a five, because I know what five looks like, and I see a two. I know that this is four lines, right? And if I have a bar through it, then it's five so that they see the numbers in different ways. It's not always dot patterns that I'm subitizing. I would see different variations. So those are also in your um, Moving Forward website. They're at the very, very beginning of the year. You can go in and just download them. I can show you where those are as well. So we're also working on partitioning. We're looking at sharing. We talked about money. You could do that with Cuisinaire rods. How would I take an orange rod and share an orange rod between you and me? So they would have to know that two yellows make an orange rod, two fives make a 10. What other rods exist that you could share between two people? What if you took pattern blocks and said, which of the pattern blocks could we put two things on top of that look the same? So in other words, the yellow hexagon, I can put the two red trapezoids on. You would get one, I would get one. Those are two equal halves. We see the visual. What other shapes are there? What about the desi blocks, the, the step up from the pattern blocks? Which one of those have two equal pieces that we can use? How do you build the equal pieces for the boat? And so on. So lots of different places that we can bring in symmetry, bring in the have conversation, and build patterning conversations at the same time. We already started talking about equal, not equal, less than, more than when we started talking about numbers to 20 and then as we started moving forward. So is this number large or smaller? Is this number the same? Are two five yellow rods the same as one orange rod? Yes, they are. How do I know? Two fives are a 10. I can show you by putting the two five rods on an orange rod. They're the same color. I can show you that a yellow hexagon is made of two red trapezoids, etc. So there's lots of ways that I can show equal to and not equal to. One of your outcomes is also to use a balance. So can they see how things are equal? If you're using quiz and air rods, the wooden ones, I don't know about the plastic ones if they'll work the same. But when you put the wooden ones in, even if you change the, let's say the blue one, which is a nine, and you made it into three threes and put a black one in and a blue and a black over here, they should weigh out the same. Like they are scaled to be exactly the same weight. So it's another way for students to see different combinations of numbers give me the same thing. So the part part whole, we kind of talked about that now. When we're looking at your equations, we're not calling it that for students, but really that's really what you're doing in developing all of those different possible combinations. If I put an orange rod up here, I'm looking for what part might I match to this part. So if I just quickly go into And we'll just use that orange one right off the bat. Okay, so here is our two. Not only do I have two equal halves, I also have symmetry down the center. This side looks the same as that side. But if I just flip these around, if I'm talking about part, part, whole, if I say that my whole is at the top, and I usually don't do them on the mat anymore. I just do them on the whiteboard. I just put whatever bar up there I want. And then I might say, I'm going to put one part down here. And what part am I going to have to put in that's going to, to fit in that's going to be missing on this side? Well, students usually double check it. They'll always drag it up there. Okay, two yellows. But what if I didn't put a yellow one there? What if I put a red one there? Come on. Okay, so there's my part. What's my other? part that needs to make my whole. And that goes right back to the different equations that you're trying to, the different scenarios. Do I have the whole? I'm missing a part. Do I have two parts? I'm missing the whole. All the different combinations. And then asking them, does it make a difference if I make it look like this 
or if I had started with the orange and just put them in a different combination. Like, does that change anything? No, just a different order, but the numbers didn't change. And now we're in a position where I can go two plus eight is the same as eight plus two. So I can start working on that commutative property. It doesn't matter what order. Change the different colors. What's the new patch? So I can do that with Cuisinier rods. I could do that with money. I could put 10 cents up here if you wanted to and put two pennies down here. What are you missing? Right. Any of those combinations, the more they see different ways of having that same part, part, whole, the better it is, especially when it comes to money. So we've got the Cuisinier rods. You could do it with pattern blocks. They would work the same. You can even do it with those. So any one of these combinations could be done with this mat. This mat is also in your Moving Forward website. Okay, we've done those. So we've talked about halves. We've talked about the importance of them finding halves. So in this case, I was just looking for comics even, two eyes. So one side, left side, right side, look reasonably the same, blocks the same. These are not the same. They're the same size, but different colors. So they could be symmetrical, whatever, however you want this conversation. But this is the kind of conversation that they should be able to have when they build something that's symmetrical. Okay, we talked about fractions already. So these are the diagrams that are in your kit. And you can download these. You don't have to build a kit. You can download these at any time. We had created those cards because some teachers said, I would just love every child to have their own card for names and that they can practice with them. Don't have to. You could just have them available only when you need them. But you'll find them in the Moving Forward site in the Grade 1 kit. And as you will, all of your other templates, right? Those are the important pieces. Let me just go there and show you where that is. So you're going to go under additional resources into the math kits. Oops. And there we go. So just below is where you find all of those pieces that you can photocopy if you want. And then there's all the money mats as well. So it just gives us a chance to revisit. If we haven't used some of them, then they would be new to the students, new for them to see, but not necessarily new as far as uh, activity that they're gonna do. At the bottom, I've also included some models for symmetry. And if you can ignore some of the ads that come into play here, it was more the uh, pieces that I was looking for here so that you'd have an interactive. So that they can see that a symmetry means I have a line, just like the half of my sandwich. There's an imaginary line that I created when I used my knife to cut it. So here I see my line and I see both sides or a book gets opened up and I see the, the binding or the center piece in there. So that they have an opportunity just to see those in action of what the line of symmetry looks like. There's a lot of ads on there, which drive me nuts. I've also included some sheets from uh, a number of different places. Again, these are royalty free, so you're welcome to photocopy them, download them. But again, it's just an opportunity for them to write yes or no. Do they think that the line that they're seeing would actually let them fold it and create two sides that would be the same? So is that a line of symmetry? Is it a half on each side? We could talk about that. Do I see same things on both sides? And a lot of times older students, even in junior high, will say a yes to this one because they just think that anything that's got four sides like this, especially a rectangle, when I fold it over, it's just gonna fit and this corner will not come over here. So it's not a line of symmetry, but they should try it, right? They just give them a piece of paper and let them try it. Same thing with these. So just an opportunity for them to play around a little bit if you've got the shapes where they can fold them first and then double check. And then here is your sparkle box. And I'm gonna put this one into the chat box for you. I did bring you to the page that says symmetry on it, but this is also where you'd find all of the number paths and number lines. Again, these are free. You don't have to worry about copyright. Okay, I just threw that in the chat box if you wanna grab it. And I would just bookmark it. You can use any and everything off of this site except the money. This comes from the UK, so their money, although it is crown, uh, won't have the same 
pictures on it that our money does. But here you've got lots of choices for symmetry where students can just get different pictures that they can see and find things that are or are not symmetrical. Legos, that's another one that's great for symmetry. Can you create something that's symmetrical using your Lego blocks? So again, the um, medicine wheel is a perfect example of a cycle. It actually shows me that I have a circle that's been cut in half in a number of different directions, but they're not necessarily the same color, but I can see that I could take the circle and fold it over. And in this case, each one of these different colors is a different season. So if you've been doing the cycles with the seasons, then you might want to bring this one into to play as well, so that you can have a conversation about each season has its own animal, each animal has its own meaning, um, part of the seven grandfather teachings, why are they important, etc. And if you need more info on that, I've got tons. So just let me know and I can send it to you. So with measurement, we don't do a, a ton of direct measurement. Everything that they do is indirect measurement. And a lot of it is estimation. What's a reasonable amount for me to measure by? Is it reasonable for me to use my finger to measure the length of the, the entire whiteboard? Probably not. We probably want something that's a little bit bigger and not take us quite as long. So they're looking at qualitative and quantitative descriptions, but they're, they're starting to make decisions first about what's reasonable. So let's look at one of the number line activities uh, that you could use with students, especially when you're talking about, you know, do they need to go to 100 or not go to 100? So let's start small. You may have some students that are still struggling or some students that are struggling, period, just with math in general, um, that you would have this type of a number line that's very open. It's open for a reason. One, I can go from zero to 10 if I want to, or I'm going to, step up the, the thinking behind it and say, whatever number you start at is going to be here. And if you have enough of the tick marks in there to put your next number in, great. If you don't, put it at the end and you know there's a whole bunch of numbers that will go in between. So how does this work? In your file folder, you will have sheets that look like this. They're called either all tens. So all tens means I gave you a sheet of just all numbers one to 10. So if you still have some little kiddos that are struggling and they, they haven't gone past 10 yet, then you just want to keep them there. If you've got students that are ready to go to 20, 30, 40, 50, there's some to 100, uh, it's whatever you need. And we just put them into bags and label them accordingly. So if you've got some high flyers that are ready, they're in the 50s to 100, but they haven't mastered 80s and 90s yet, that's okay. Give them a little bit of a challenge, let them nudge themselves. But we just cut these apart and put them into little bags like this. So if I'm starting small, very small, and I, and I don't have a good grasp yet on 20, then I might just start with 1 to 10. And what the student might do is just turn over. They're going to turn these all face down so that you don't see them, they don't see them. They turn one over, and then they put it on the number line. So can they find it on the number line? Because that's part of our, our testing pieces as well. So if I had four, I would put four, one, two, three, four. Okay. If I turned over two numbers, then I would hope, and I see this one's in the wrong place, now that I look at it, one, two, yep, it is. So if I put one, whatever the smallest number is, should be in the first place, and then two, three, four should be over here. All I'm doing is checking to see, do they know the comparative language, which is less, which is greater, which is smaller, which is larger, which goes on a number line to the left, which goes on the number line to the right. That's all you're checking, really, is all it's doing. If they're well beyond 10, then we can go ahead and we can give them larger numbers. Here I turned over three and eight, and I'm looking for to ask them, what number comes in front of this number? What's the number that came before it? And you might even say, what's two numbers that came before it, if that's where you want to go? What's a number that comes right after it? Because there's nothing labeled here. What's two numbers that come after it? Can you tell me any other numbers that are in between this number and this number? And I'm never saying the number. I'm always just letting them see the number so that I'm not triggering or saying something like you gave me four, can you give me another number? Let them choose and tell you what they know. If they are ready to go to 100, then you might want to use the other sheet that looks something like this. And so again, they're going to turn over two numbers depending on which bag you gave me. 
The smallest number always goes in the box. And then we ask that question. This number line didn't go on this side, but I'm going to ask the question, what's the number that came before this number? What's the number that's one after this number? Like what would sit here if we were going to label it? What would be two after that number? And what would be three numbers that come in between this number and the other one that you had? And if they never get to put those numbers back in the bag, they will never draw the same two numbers again. So they just leave it on their sheet, draw another two numbers, try it again. If they, let's say, drew, I'm just going to pick really odd numbers, seven, probably wouldn't give you seven if you're, if you're doing really well, and they drew 66. Well, obviously, there's not enough in here. So the smallest number always goes in the box. If I don't have enough tick marks, 66 goes at the end. And now they have unlimited choices that they can put in there for the three numbers in between. And it's really kind of interesting. We were in, I was actually in Leah's class when we did this, and one of the little guys said to me, I'm going to try and trick you. When, I, when he was looking for the three numbers in between, he said, I'm going to trick you. And he thought if he skipped, you know, five or six numbers in between, that it was going to throw me off. And I thought, whoa, this is big. But this was their thinking, that they could come up with any three numbers. I'm going to spread them out. And it just gave them that opportunity to pick the different places. The other nice part of it is it also gives you a good sense of do they have a sense of what number is in between those two? You could take the numbers from your bag and just put a number line down on string if you wanted to and put zero and 50 and 100 on the string and then give me the number and a little close peg and say, go put your number on the string where you think it belongs. And if you've got 50 marked and I drew 67 and I put it right beside 50, then I want to have a conversation with them, right? Do, do they really think that 67 is that close to 50? Or is it a little bit further away? Because look where 100 is. Look where the halfway mark is. So just having that estimation and that idea of where numbers fit on the number line does not have to be perfect. But we're looking for, do they have a good understanding? OK, one of the other requests that has been made is some people are asking is, do we have any quick sheets that we could just, just check? see where they're at with their counting and and if we're going to do some subitizing have a conversation with them about how they got their answer so this is a package that's actually in your handout there's a whole bunch of sheets here and i usually just put them into a pocket plastic pocket folder and then just give the kids a dry erase marker and so again if they're skip counting by twos they could do the carrots that way if they're not skip counting by twos, they probably aren't going to see that, or they do two, four, six, eight, and, and they'll do it that way. Some of them will see four, and then they'll look for groups of four. So it's just the conversation. How did you get your answer? And what was your thinking behind it? Just as a formative assessment for us to see where are they at and what is their thinking? There's all different kinds of pictures and different levels in there, so you can just pick and choose whichever one you want. I can't share this one with you, but I did give you the link for it. It costs $3, and then there's eight different games. They look exactly the same as this, but they're all different in their, in their layout. What this is is just a spin. They play with two students, or three students maybe. Take a paper clip and a pencil and just spin it. And whatever shape they land on, and again, I would just put this in a plastic pouch and give them two different colored dry erase markers. I can put my, I play X's and O's, so I get three X's in a row or four X's in a row, whatever you've decided they have to have. So I get to choose. So if I landed on a circle, I could, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here, I go anywhere I want that I see there's a circle. But we also learned very quickly that grade one, two, and threes were very perceptive in realizing that some of them had multiple shapes on them. So the ring, for example, has a circle. The clock has a circle and has the octagon on it. So if I spun a circle, I get to choose which shape I'm going to go to. And if I chose this one, I have to say I'm choosing it because I'm using the clock, the face of the clock. So they have to identify why they're picking that. If I chose this one, I'd have to say I'm using the band on it because I could roll the rhombus, and then I could say I'm going to choose the ring because of the diamond that's on it. They quite like this game because they're all different, so there could be eight different centers. They would never see the same game twice. So there's lots of different ways for them to interpret it. 
And there's also things that we need to be aware of that multiple shapes could have different options in it. So we have to just be flexible. So here's the link to it. Um, again, because it's a copyrighted one, I can't share that whole thing with you. So just again, some ideas, people were looking for some ideas for tables, like what can I do for sorting? What can I do for putting different pieces together? Sort the objects. Again, what are the attributes that they used for sorting? Were they using the shape this time, the 2D shape, the 3D shape? Were they using the fact that it had sharp corners on it, vertices? So what was their thinking? And then if they did it one way, can we just put them all back on the table? And can you, you now redo it with a different uh, rule? sorting rule that you're going to have. These are just um, cards that you can get as well. There's ideas where you can have math talks with the students. The back of the card just gives you as a teacher what questions you might want to ask and it also gives you what you might hear as a response that isn't correct or maybe not complete and then what do you follow up with. So again they're just ideas, nothing more than that. So a couple of things that I want to share with you. Um, K5 Learning, I put that link in there for you. I'm gonna throw this one in the chat box because if you have not bookmarked this one, I would really like you to do that. This is one that you could use for every unit you teach. This is not specific to today. K5 Learning, we've used them before, but just bookmark it because everything that they have here, I am not a worksheet um, advocate at all, but I am an advocate of formative assessment. And if I can find something that is a really good formative assessment, I will grab it. And anything that K5 does is readily available and done very, very well. So I would suggest that maybe just marking it, if you go into grade one, remember this is UK, so not necessarily our grade one. You may have to go to grade two to grab some of your materials. But you see that we have all of the pieces in here. You just can't go with the money again. Uh, and I can grab any one of the pieces that I want and just go from, from there. I, let me just grab one for base 10. So they're done, they're short, they're never long. Okay, they're always done in such a way that I can simply grab them and just pull them off. Nothing here is copyrighted. So you can access any and all of everything that you want and any grade. Again, I'm not saying to do this as a worksheet, I'm saying to do this as a formative. And there's so many sheets in there that you could literally have small groups of kids working with you, like pods of four, and each one of them would get the same level of assessment, but they would all have different sheets so that you can just quickly just watch what's happening. And then you don't have to create them and, and, and come up with all these, just we, we have way more better things to do with our time. I won't go to this one. Making Math Moments is John Orr and Kyle Pierce. They do a lot of free PDs for teachers, but they also are the ones who advocate for thinking outside the box a little bit, like take that number and put it on a string. Like don't just do it as a rote count one unit at a time and get them there. So if you're looking for some ideas, again, I gave you the link for that one. The other one that I really want you to bookmark is this one here, which is from the Ontario Teachers Federation. Oops, it's gonna get my mouse sorted out here. So their ministry does a really great job, always has, of putting materials in for their teachers to use. Most of them are readily available to us. So it's in the chat box if you wanna grab it. And again, because of the way our, our uh, curriculum is, you will need to go to grade two sometimes, quite a bit more than maybe not, uh, to find some of the uh, outcomes that match ours. So I know it's small, but if you can just look up on my screen for a second, I just wanna point out to you what's at the top. Not all of it is, is relevant at this point, but here you see the different strands per se at the top in the blue. So I'm gonna go to number. So I just wanna show you what you see. So you'll have grade one to grade eight, obviously you don't need all of those, but you'll spend time in grade one and grade two. And what you do is all you do is read the descriptor that's below that. And then if that is what you would like to work on with the students or assess the students at, then click on the blue 
and that will bring the materials up for you. Now, it's not just a single little bit of material. I'll click one on. You're going to get a whole page of choices here. So you'll see that you get all of these different things that will come up. The videos we don't have access to, but the games you do, you have access to the activities, you have access to the worksheets. Not a lot of worksheets, but there are some. So you just need to read the top of this first, and if it's what you think works for you, then click it on and the whole thing will come up for you. So it's a pretty intense uh, place to go, but it, it kind of covers almost any and every, doesn't matter what curriculum you're teaching. Uh, we pretty much have everything there. So feel free to share that with the teachers in your school as well. Okay, so the other piece that I want to just cover with you, some resources teachers were asking, are there any books that would work right now? Like just we have some new ideas for the rest of the year while we re sort of revisit for mastery. Fundamentals, this comes from Orego. Um, these are all outcome based. So it doesn't matter that it doesn't fit necessarily our grade, it's the outcome that we're looking for but they're all game based and they're all black and white and they're all like one page, maybe another page. So they're easy to implement in the classroom um, and they come in sort of spans of grades. So there's one, there's a, the orange one is one, two, and then the purple is two, three. And you would use from both of those books because they have the different, they're a great little resource to have in the school because they also, instead of just doing a typical, you know, I'm gonna match with my pencil and draw, I'm going to do the same outcome. I'm just going to do it in a game format. And the kids love them. They're, they're easy to implement. If you're looking for some um, inquiry types of questions, looking for some open-ended questions where they don't just have a straight one answer and we're done, one and done, then the books from Rubicon, they're, they're done by strand. So they're still in the old one, number strands, geometry, space, all that stuff. But they come in groups of K to three. And so the front third of the book and fourth quarter of the book, sorry, is all about kindergarten. They start with a really simple question and then they make it a little bit more difficult and then they make it a little more difficult. And they give you all the activities that they would need. So it's not just what's the answer and then we're done, let's move on. It gives them a little bit of thought process. Also, if you're looking at cycles, if you were looking for other resources, these are ones that I found earlier in the year. So they are from each of the different um, seasons, but they also are all math related. So counting, obviously, there's what it's all about. It's about counting, sizing up has to do with measurement, sorting through, and then shaping up is the 2D, 3D. They're a nice little series of books to have. So if your library has them, great. If not, maybe that's something that they can look at purchasing. So they're nice literacy, numeracy combinations. Okay, are there any questions?